Battery Generation. Brought to you by Celeste. Welcome to Battery Generation, your podcast on electromobility and European battery research. Leonard, we're back. That's good to be back. Hey, Patrick, how are you doing? Leonard, in the last episodes, we mainly talked to chemists researching innovative future cell mixes. This time, we're talking to an engineer. And as you know, not only battery cell chemistry is an expanding field, the entire battery industry is growing a lot. And that includes businesses that you probably not necessarily think of at the beginning. For example, battery design and production of modules and battery packaging. Welcome to an engineering show. Yes, and dear listeners, before we start, thank you for all your emails. Thank you for all your support with all your questions and ideas of what topics we could cover next. And as always, if you tune into that show for the first time, hit that subscribe button. And if you really want to do us a solid, give us a good rating in your podcast app. You should find us on any available podcast app out there. Thank you so much. Today, we'll talk to Ionetics CEO and co-founder James Eaton from London, UK. Welcome, James, to our show. Thanks for having me, guys. James, you spent four years working in battery pack research at the Imperial College of London. Your goal is to, and I'm going to quote you now, to help automotive companies make the electrification transition with great engineering solutions at a price point they can afford. Your company, a tier one battery pack company, manufactures battery packs, modules, and designs custom made solutions. James, once more, could you uh, briefly explain your business model behind Ionitech? Yeah, thank you. I mean, that was that was a great intro. Um, thank you. Um, our business model is we want to make battery packs more affordable. Um, there are so many car companies um, around the UK, in Europe, and, and in the world who cannot afford to electrify. Um and that needs to change, right? We need to make sure those car companies can uh, afford to electrify. So what we do is we can make battery pack development, so getting from vision to in production, we can make that up to 90% cheaper compared to existing solutions. And we can do that while creating a great engineering product that satisfies all your requirements. Um, you know, in some cases, we can double the range. That's that's the best we've ever done. So, you know, there are a lot of benefits to our business model. So you're basically the outsourced battery department for these OEMs? Um, yeah, you can, you can look at it like that. I mean, depending on how big uh, the car company is, it might be that we're working in partnership with a battery team or that we are essentially the, the main bulk of the battery team. And that's that's not uncommon. Automotive uh, companies, they depend heavily on their tier ones. Um, and there are huge, huge tier ones that support car companies. You know, most seats are not made by car companies. Um, most wheels, most seat belts and all these different components, they're not made by the car companies. They're made by tier ones who support them. And we're in that category for batteries. For our audience, just real quick, could you... Um just define the difference between those those um, keywords pack, module, and cell. So so which is what? Just so we get it right from the start. Yeah. So so cell's pretty easy, but module and pack can get a bit blurred. Um, so the cell is the sort of the smallest unit, I guess. So you know, in, in a Tesla, that would be a cylindrical, uh, a twenty one seventy or a forty six eighty. Um, so it's a cylindrical metal can. There are other formats like pouch cells and prismatics, which are more rectangular or cuboid. Um, so that's the cell. Then to get to a module, you take some of those cells, you know, maybe maybe 10, maybe 100, maybe 700, and you put them in a box. If you take, my, my, this is our definition, if you take multiple of those and put them in a bigger box, that becomes the pack. However... If you just keep that first box that you had and put a control system on it and a BMS, then that module becomes the pack. So that the, there are some sort of blurred lines between what a module is and what a pack is. Um, and it really sort of depends on your solution. I mean, in some cases, one module is enough to create a pack for your solution. But in most cases, that's not the case and you end up with multiple modules. Could you describe once more what is the core problem of these OEMs, your first customers? Is that 
the the lack of time, uh, maybe the costs that they would have if they design own um, battery modules or packs? Um, or are you a process innovation? Could you take us on that trip? What is what is the core problem you're solving? Say you're a, a low volume car company. Um, your vehicle development budget to build a whole new car, every component in it. Um, Yeah, maybe it's 20 million euros or maybe it's 50 or maybe it's even 100 or 150 million euros. If you want to design a new battery pack from scratch right now, you have to go to a design consultancy who will charge you anywhere from 15 to 40 million euros for just the design. Then you have to go to a test house and they'll charge you anywhere from 5 to 20 million euros to homologate and certify the product. And then you've got to work out how you make the thing, whether it's you know capex into a factory or whether it's going to an external solution, and, and it basically ends up in a position where the cost of developing a battery pack is completely incompatible with the vehicle development budget. If your vehicle development budget is fifty million for an EV, all of that is going to the pack. So then you have no budget to do literally anything else. You're just going to have a battery pack with no wheels. Um, and, and that and that's the problem we're trying to solve, right? Is we're trying to make it so that it doesn't cost fifty million for the development cost of a battery pack. So it's actually more affordable. So you can actually electrify. And that leads to, to the next question. So um, because why is this flexibility and customization in uh, EV uh, design so important to 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 your customers, to especially probably to to smaller um, automobile makers? I mean, it's essentially because. If you can't customize, you, you can't create the product you want to sell. It would be like, you know, trying to use a monster truck to drive around the streets of Rome, right? It just doesn't, it's not compatible with with, with what you want out of a product. And, that, you know, and for the smaller car companies and for passenger cars, the benefits we bring are things like we can make the height of the pack shorter, We can make it so that if your vehicle dynamics team wants a certain track width and a certain wheelbase, we'll fit the pack in that instead of the individual, you know, off-the-shelf modules driving the size of the of the vehicle. We can actually fit in what you need. So your vehicle dynamics team don't get annoyed with your battery team because the battery team are saying, no, you have to make the whole vehicle 10 centimeters wider. In things like you know, commercial delivery vans or, or trucks, the, the benefit we add is, is increasing that energy density. So by having more energy density, you can either, you know, make the pack smaller um, and save the weight or you can increase the range. Um, so you can actually change the business case. And it's the same in something like a bus, right? You know, buses care a lot about the pack height. So again, we've got the benefit of making the pack smaller, but we've also got that benefit of increasing energy density so you can fit more people in the vehicle. So there are a variety of benefits depending on sort of which customer group you fit in. One of your marketing text states that Ionitech accelerates battery pack development like never before. Its software can boost energy density by 30% and increase utilization of pack volume by up to 120% comparing to existing off-the-shelf solutions. Tell us once more, how is that possible? These are great performance numbers. It's essentially because we are customizing the product just for you every time. You, you come to us with a new set of requirements and we will create a new module and a new pack. You, you don't go and get a box of batteries and see if that fits because you know those solutions are fine, but they're just not optimized for what you really need. So we create that optimized solution. In terms of the software side, we, we've created this really great software where you can tell me as the OEM, As, a, as the car company or the truck company, yeah, what, what are your needs? What energy do you need? What, what are your voltage requirements? What mass does it need to be and what volume does it need to fit in? And then it will run through our software, an optimization, where it says, you know, of all the thousands of solutions within our architecture you could have, which one works the best for you? Which one fully utilizes the space? And then it says... Here's the number of modules you need. Here's how they should be configured. Here's what the series and parallel should be. And then we can create that solution. We can take that solution into a concept um, that we can then build and, and put into a vehicle. 
Just for the record, this episode is called Sell to Pack and Sell to Chassis. Um, we hear these buzzwords all the time, uh, and these technologies are, are used quite frequently in, in, in the language here at the institutes as well. Uh, could you briefly explain which part is your company based on? Is that um, only Sell to Pack or as well Sell to Chassis, which is based on the thought that uh, you're using every inch of a vehicle's body to put batteries inside some of these terms can get a bit branded and yeah they sort of end up coming from specific companies but the fundamental point of these of these terms is that you want to increase the utilized volume as much as possible um in cell to pack the way you do that is essentially by removing as much structural weight as possible and creating uh, a system where you have really large modules um, where the cells are are load bearing and, and obviously the famous example here is that is the Tesla pack and so that's what's in everyone's brain right now and what we do is something quite similar to that we are making an architecture here where we maximize the size of the modules to minimize the pack weight so we're sort of tending towards that cell to pack architecture Cell to vehicle and cell to chassis basically means you you create a pack which is completely integral to the vehicle structure and almost is the only structural member in that space. The issue with that is the development cost just skyrocket because you've got to have you've got to have such an embedded relationship between the battery team, between the chassis team, between all your suppliers. So it, that's currently really only available to someone like Tesla who have that complete vertical integration. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get everyone from zero to a great engineering solution. That's where we're at. We're trying to make sure that these people who currently can't electrify and can't even create any electrified solution, let alone sell to pack or sell to chassis we're trying to get them into ev i was i was thinking uh, when i was reflecting upon the terms that um an issue maybe with sell to vehicle could be so if i have a problem with my battery um <laughs> you basically have to disassemble the whole car and just get out all those uh, different cells whereas if you have a pack i can just identify the faulty pack and since it's probably standardized i can just the mechanic could replace it probably more easier. Is, is, is that a fair assumption or how would you describe that? Yeah, definitely. I think for, for us, we can, we can replace a module. Um, so if a module fails, we can replace a module. Um, I mean, I don't want to speak to other cell to pack and cell to chassis solutions, but looking at them, they do look quite hard to fix anything. Um, like if anything goes wrong, I feel like those packs are probably done and they're probably going to have to be recycled and potentially that's a valid strategy um, but our strategy is to keep the pack in the vehicle in first life for as long as possible um, because we think that's the way to truly sort of minimize carbon emissions in total um, but yeah it, it's definitely a valid point it'll be interesting to see how, how companies develop those strategies about recycling and about repair and about reusability as we make the packs a more integral part of, of the powertrain and the chassis and the vehicle. Let's talk uh, about the core product you offer. It is the ARC platform um, or design platform um, that is able to generate a fully customized battery pack concept within minutes. Could you take us on that trip? If a, a new customer comes to you and you offer a, um, yeah, a, a process with that uh, design platform, how does that look like? Yeah, so customers will come to us um, and say, we want a battery pack that does X, Y, Z. So we'll go through with them all of the different requirements that we need to know. We'll then put those requirements into our software, which will tell us what the optimized solution is. We'll then be able to take that into CAD, into a virtual environment, very easily. And then we'll go through a detailed concept design phase with the customer where we take our platform and we take all those minutia, the, the tiny little points and make them just for you. You know, the obvious example being things like which way does the HV port face for the battery pack, right? Does it face forwards in the vehicle or reverse in the vehicle? And all these things, they... They tend to be different for different customers, so you've got to make sure you, you meet those requirements. 
After that, we build the product in A-sample, so in prototype. Some of those are for our own testing and validation to make sure the product's safe and good and meets all your requirements, and some of those are for vehicle integration. So those go to the car companies, and they test them to make sure they work in their cars okay. After that, it's about certifying the product with the EU, the UK, the UN, and saying, yeah, it's safe, it ticks all these boxes. And then it's about putting it into production and into mass manufacture. So that's sort of the total process and getting from zero vision, this is what I want, to in production can be, you know, for a, for a big car company, probably two, three years. And when you communicate with these OEMs, which part of the process is uh, taken most of the time and effort? I mean, in terms of time, the manufacturing is is the longest part because, you know, that's anywhere from three to seven years. So that's that's comfortably the longest part normally. Beyond, you know, before that, it's probably going from sort of A sample to C sample, like getting that, uh, the point where you're going through all of those requirements, making those design changes, doing all those different tests. That's probably the longest part before you go into production. And this platform, how do I imagine that? Is that connected to suppliers as well? So if I order, let's say, an LFP battery, lithium iron phosphate, um, could you tell me within minutes whether that's available right now on the world market or um, I mean, how do I imagine that? How sophisticated is this platform yet? So one, one thing to say to start with is that we don't currently do LFP. Um, we tend to find, because most of our um, customer base is in Europe and or the US, um, people care more about range than they do about unit cost. So currently our solutions are NMC and they use cylindrical cells. And that is a customer-driven decision. We would like soon to bring in an LFP solution so we can work in those developing markets where unit cost is significantly more important. But the platform itself, it's not necessarily linked to suppliers because we're doing that work sort of manually, I, I guess, outside of the platform, You know, identifying which suppliers we want to work with for which component. Some of the components bespoke to specific suppliers. But some of them we can say, this is what we want, and then we can do an RFQ and go to five different companies and say, we want this, how much is it going to cost? Um, so it's not connected to suppliers in terms of stock globally. You know, because the contracts of supply are so big, it's not a case of like you know going on Amazon and clicking buy, sadly, um, as, as nice as that would be. So um, is the process more like I am the client, I, I'll give you some uh, some numbers at, that I want to reach with my pack and you um, let the software decide uh, maybe an algorithm how this pack should be assembled um, cell-wise or um, is that software main, mainly a graphic or like an architectural software? Oh, no. I mean, it's an engineering tool. Like we, we very much care about the output. Um It will, you know, based on power and voltage and energy, it will tell you how many modules you need, how many series, how many parallel, um, and all, all those different components that feed into the real design that really goes in the car. Um, and one of the foundational principles of that piece of software is that we've already gone through and chosen materials and geometries and manufacturing processes. So... Ordinarily, you go to a design consultancy and they have a list of every module material you could use, every manufacturing process, every different bus bar geometry and design. And then they spend a year or two just working out from that list of thousands of things, which one you should use. What we've done is we've just chosen them because we know that it won't actually make an enormous difference to most automotive applications. There are edge cases, for sure. If you want to build a battery pack for F1, our platform is not applicable. It's a whole other ballgame. But for most automotive applications, our platform will be perfectly suitable. Maybe 2% not as optimized as if you'd spent the two years and the 30 million pounds choosing every material. But we save you 30 million pounds. So we think it's normally a win. James, thank you for that example. I'm going to give you another one. It comes from your PR text that you guys have published. Um, 
Ionitech says many existing commercially available battery packs have energy densities of 130 till 160 watt hours per kilogram a tesla model 3 has a module energy density of 197 watt hours per kilogram and a pack energy density of 156 watt hours per kilogram ionitech's batteries modules now have an energy density of 226 watt hours per kilogram that's outstanding and ionitech's pack architecture is most similar to tesla that's what you guys stated so a pack energy density of at least 180 watt hours per kilogram is targeted how has this pack been produced james or does that even exist in reality uh yeah no it's a real module that exists um it's it's in the lab um over over there somewhere um it really exists it, we really weighed it it really does yeah, it really does have that energy density of 226 watt hours per kilogram yeah i mean it's just a great piece of engineering um frankly it's a great a great piece of engineering that allows us to unlock those numbers uh and then provide those to, to our customers um and again because of what we spoke about earlier where we're maximizing the size of the module you know tending towards as much volume utilization as we can when we go from module to pack we lose as little as possible um, whereas if you've got a situation where you are filling a pack with 33 modules then you're going to lose so much weight when you go from that module to the pack just in the structure of those modules so much space so much you know wasted mass is just spent on packaging cells when that could have been more cells or a smaller pack no i get it um, it's always the question whoever is not in the industry might think of hey why isn't tesla actually now interested in optimizing their battery packs um it's always the question of how um how much effort did it take for you to reach these numbers so on a mass scale is this possible to produce that um that pack um you, you could put it in, i mean you're not suggesting we put that specific module into mass production because we would rather optimize it for every customer but um yeah you could put it into production um i think different companies end up optimizing for different things right um like tesla's modules and tesla's packs are filled with adhesive and it, you know it feels like adhesive should weigh nothing but it does weigh something um and that's what they've decided is the optimum solution for them. They just absolutely fill the whole thing full of potting material and adhesives. And that means, it's, you know, in theory, it's never going to vibrate itself to death. Um, but, you know, there are sacrifices that come with that. And, and, you know, filling the thing full of adhesive is very different from having no adhesive. But maybe there's a middle ground that might be a better optimization for this problem with your software you've you've created a tool that automates uh, the um, optimization process that that usually would take two years and you mentioned 30 million um euros uh, for 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 creation so so that's basically your key thing your key tool but then you also offer the the um the production and uh, essentially mass production of these uh, packs yeah, because, I mean, the reason we offer both the design and the manufacture is because, you know, one problem is companies can't afford to design these packs. But let's say we solved that, right? Let's say we worked out how to make it cheaper. We would then design these packs, hand them to the car companies. And if you're a particularly small car company, you are just going to be stuck then. We've just, we've just changed your problem. We've changed the problem from we can't design a battery pack to we can't make a battery pack. So you actually need both sides of this to actually solve the problem properly. You, ne you need to be able to take a car company from, I want a battery pack, to it is being delivered to your vehicle assembly line. One other benefit is that as a business model, most of our money is made in the manufacturing. And that, that to anyone with any knowledge of the unit economics, that won't come as any remote surprise, which means that the margins on design can be lower. You know, we don't need to put huge margins on it like the design companies do. Um, and they have to do that because that is their business model. That is the only revenue generation they get. 
So we can bring the cost of this down because we're more efficient at it, because we've got this platform, and because we don't have to make enormous margins on it. Uh, we all heard about these crazy um, world market prices for batteries, for materials especially. Uh, where do you buy these cells from now? You said NMC cells are preferred from your uh, customer's side. Where do you buy them from? Yeah, I mean, we probably can't name specific people. But what I can say is there are a lot of cell suppliers on Earth. One benefit we have is we get to amalgamate and bring together a lot of different companies' demands so that our demand is actually reasonably significant. Um, yes, costs have gone up slightly, um, but I think everyone's still of the opinion that over the next sort of eight years, they will come down by a significant amount, like not just recover, but come down way beyond that. Um, so yeah, we buy 21,700 NMC cells, um, And we try to do that from multiple suppliers in order to ensure we have a secure supply chain for our customers. We, of course, have an eye on the sustainability of these uh, batteries. You didn't name any country now. We hope um, these cells are manufactured in a very green way. Do you have any information about that? Or do your um, customers um, kind of need to get that information? Yeah, I think obviously the sort of looking at the total carbon footprint of the pack is something we care about a lot. And we... Um, as we grow, being net zero is one of our targets. And then, you know, after that, it will be net negative, And after that, it'll be true zero. Um, but that's a goal we have for, for you know, the next sort of five years of this decade. Um, in terms of where the cells come from, I think it's, it's no surprise to anyone that 70% of all batteries on Earth are made in China. Um, we want the cells to be made in Europe. 100% made in the UK, made in Germany, um, for a variety of reasons, security of supply, cash flow, um, ease of communication, having only one hour time difference. And we hope that the, the European battery supply chain will continue to grow and grow strongly um, to support that and support our, our facility of, of manufacturing packs for sure. We today heard about Tesla um, now going into the direction of NMC again and less NCA cells. Uh, is there a specific reason why um, nickel cobalt are preferred uh, from your customer side? NMC cells, why is that the only uh, cell chemistry you're providing? Um, well, if you look at sort of mar the markets, NMC is by far the biggest cell. Um, in terms, sorry, biggest chemistry in terms of popularity, which means there's more options, there's more availability, um, there's more in the market. So that's one potential reason. Um, I think if you also look at the sort of baseline chemistry, NMC is fractionally more energy dense um, and a bit less power dense. Um, NMC is in theory also a slightly safer chemistry. Um, so there are a few reasons you can you can do that. But from our perspective, we see NMC as being the prevailing chemistry for at least the next 10 years. I, I'm, I'm actually a little bit surprised, to be honest. We have talked about so many different cell materials over here, um, including sodium ion batteries. And of course, LFP and NCA were, were among them. Uh, I think for the future, at least that's what I heard, uh, battery researchers expect LFP and NCA to be the leading uh, cell chemistries in the future. But, you know, um, none of them have a, you know, 100% problem in glass ball in front of them so that's interesting yeah, yeah. at least it's interesting for us to hear that that nmc is uh you know the the only cell chemistry that you guys are providing since um lfp or especially sodium ion batteries will definitely play a role in, within the next 10 years so yeah i, I agree i agree i mean I, i i love sodium ion as a as a concept i think they're great i mean you can discharge them to zero sodium is really abundant so in theory the cells should be cheap um, I, I'd love to see them commercialized. Um, you know, when I can get my hands on some commercially ready sodium ion cells, I'll love to see it. I think the thing about LFP is currently it's a lot cheaper, but I think NMC is going to come down in cost so much that that trade-off won't make much sense by 2030. 
And I think LFP 100% has its place. Like I mentioned in developing in developing markets where the unit economics matter and the matter now, then LFP definitely has a position there where range is less of a problem or less of a, it's not even a problem, where range is less conscious, um, less of a conscious thought by the consumer. Um, so I, I, I sort of see that NMC probably will stay the most popular. And if you look at some of the benchmarks from, um, various consultancies, that seems to be the prevailing thought there as well. Definitely. And we um, read all of your press texts. Uh, of course, it's always about impressing the customer. And I'm pretty sure that sodium ion batteries and LFP batteries are not really helpful when you really want to reach high numbers in, in terms of range and, uh, and performance. That's for sure. Yeah. All right, James, let's go on with uh, your company's goals and questions we had uh, at preparing this podcast. Your mission on your website states that um, you want to produce 10 gigawatt hours of packs by 2027 with plant capacities of 5 gigawatt hours a year. And that's a small gigafactory when comparing that, for example, to Tesla's gigafactory in Germany, Grünheide. Um, where do you stand there right now? I mean, that's a huge mission. Um, yeah, yeah, it is a huge mission. Um, but I think the market demand is there for it. I mean, customers are coming to us weekly, daily, asking, you know, can we support this or that? Um, so I think the market is there for it 100%. And, you know, maybe it seems like a big number in the context of 2022. Um, but, you know, we, we need to get to, you know, terawatt hours um, to, to support the electrification and to support decarbonization. Um, so, you know, this is the, the part we're playing. We're trying to help those sort of lower volume companies and the lower volume product lines. And we think five gigawatt hours probably won't even be enough when we get there. Um, we'll probably need to keep growing and keep expanding beyond that to support customer demand. But that's 100% the goal for now. May I ask you, um, how does uh, the grid of uh, renewable energies look like uh, in Britain? Is that is green electricity available? Uh, I don't know what the numbers are right now, but I mean, there's a lot of uh, wind being deployed. There's a lot of solar being deployed, which may surprise some of the international listeners um, thinking about the weather of the United Kingdom ordinarily. In general, the coal power plants have been turned off pretty much entirely in the UK, which obviously are the, the really carbon intensive um, bits. Uh, but, you know, there, there is always progress to be made. Um, you know, you look at someone like France or, you know, the Nordics, they're at single grams per kilowatt hour of CO2, whereas I think the UK is about 200. Um, so we, we, you know, we as a country and Europe as a whole and the world as a whole, need to absolutely plow on in demolishing carbon emissions and getting rid of them all. It's not about, you know, doing a bit. It's, we absolutely need to do massive things to decarbonize the grids. Our last question, I guess, comes from our last guest. It was uh, Christopher Hawks um, from Northvolt. We talked to him about supply chains. That was probably his greatest concern, um, how these supply chains will affect future um, battery production. So we're talking NMC cells, we're talking nickel, we're talking cobalt, and we're also talking, of course, graphite and lithium. Are you even worried about um, future supply chains? I'm not worried. I think when we look at these different materials, especially lithium, we've never really needed a lot of it. So we've never really looked all that hard as a planet. Um, you know, it's like we, if, you th if we look back, um, well, before I was born, but, you know, 40 years ago maybe, there was always this discussion of we're going to run out of oil, right? There's a limited supply. And then suddenly we just kept finding more. Um, and I think that is playing out now with, with critical minerals. Um, so I think we will find more. I think there will be more lithium mines and cobalt. And I mean, cobalt sort of phasing out a little bit. Same with graphite. I think one thing we need to do is really tap into 
all of the other markets that might not be the market leader, especially if we look at places like South America, if we look at places like Australia, um, there are lots of these minerals in those countries. I mean, there is lithium in the UK. There's lithium in Germany. We're just not extracting it from the ground. Um, so, you know, we, we need to make progress on those fronts. And, you know, these demand curves that you look at for EVs, the demands that you look at for batteries, you know, currently they don't really correlate with planned mining capacity. But given that the demand is there, I think the mining companies will see that and will will you know, move forward very quickly to deploy new mines and new material processing facilities. Um, so yes, it's it's hypothetically a problem that exists now, but only because we've never done a scale up like this before with an architecture. I mean, automotive is driving a huge change uh, and is changing in itself enormously. Um, so we've never really seen something like this in automotive before, you know, other than when automotive actually started. Um, so there's a lot of challenges facing that, but there's yeah, a lot of smart people working on them. Thank you very much for your time and your expertise, James. Um, dear listeners, if you got any question, ask in the comment section below or send us an email at hello at batterygeneration.com. That's hello at batterygeneration.com. And if you like this episode, hit that subscribe button. In the next episode, we are talking to the Swedish professor Emma Nerenheim. She works at Northvolt and will talk about the recycling of batteries and the plants of Northvolt uh, in northern Sweden. For more, click in, tune in and stay charged. Bye-bye.